Maybe not. It was not on. Okay, let's start again, huh? In 1962, the American German Review noted in an article on the composer Elizabeth Gearing. In our time, women seem to be catching up with men in science, business, law, on the stock market, in sports and art, especially in the performing arts, but also in the creative arts, which demand the utmost in concentration and imagination. Even in architecture, for centuries considered to be man's work, women compete successfully. But what about composing? Through the centuries, we find no very prominent woman composer. What sets music apart from the other arts as something in which, so far, women have not excelled? One wonders and is puzzled. But there is no need to be completely disheartened. One day, there will be a niche in the Hall of Fame for the outstanding woman composer. And in the meantime, it is of great interest to watch the race toward this goal. The American German Review saw Elizabeth Gearing, whose music we will hear today as one of the women composers who raced towards the goal of being accepted into the Hall of Fame of Composition. Gearing was a prolific composer who studied with prominent and prestig prestigious teachers. Her work, when performed, was positively received by both the audience and the critics. And yet, the question remains, did Gearing successfully climb the mountaintop of composition? Elizabeth Gearing was born in Vienna as Elsie Riti to Jewish parents in 1886. Historically, women composers' lives are more difficult to trace due to the relative absence of women in the public sphere, name changes after marriage, and the usage of pseudonyms. In the case of Gearing, we have to keep up with an entire list of names. Elsie Riti, Elsie Dolben after her first husband, Elsie Geiringer after her second husband. We also find Elsie Geiringer, Elsie Geiring, and eventually Elizabeth Gearing. She chose to compose and perform using pseudonyms that partially did not reveal her gender. In numerous original program notes, we find the abbreviation of Else or Elizabeth to E or even EA. Gearing grew up in an upper middle class family with a strong musical and artistic inclination. Her father was a practicing physician and the founder and conductor of the Physician's Orchestra. During her early years in Vienna, she was surrounded by chamber music, symphonic orchestras, and opera. In 1911, Gearing studied counterpoint at the University of Munich, uh, Music and Performing Arts with Arnold Schönberg and became close friends to both Schönberg and his student Alban Berg. Today, Gearing's papers are housed at the Washington State Li University Library and include some of her letters. These documents help us to reconstruct her life story and retrace the gist of her compositional fate. When Schönberg left Austria for Berlin in 1911, he recommended Gearing to study with Alban Berg. From a letter written by Berg to Schönberg, we learn that Gearing apparently never studied with Berg. Berg wrote, quote, as of now, Ms. Riti has different plans for her future and currently does, does not have time because of her engagement. Meant is the engagement to her first husband. Her then husband, Benedikt Dolben, who dabbled with composition at that time, commented that Gearing helped him with his musical career and revised some of his composition. Another example of history where a woman um, stood in her husband's um, shadow. In 1914, the First World War shook Europe. Throughout the war, Gearing took care of wounded soldiers. Again, we know this from a letter by Berg written to Schönberg in 1915. The fact that she is mentioned in letters between the two composers shows how close their friendship must have been. Numerous newspaper articles of the 1920s prove Gearing's ability and also her success in her hometown of Vienna. For instance, the Wiener Zeitung, the Viennese newspaper, wrote in 1926 about her quintet for string and clarinet that it is cultivated and shows superb tone color. Her works are performed by renowned ensembles and she is praised as a great talent whose ability is on par with her male colleagues and as a female trailblazer. In short, she was a woman composer who was clearly on the track to enter the Hall of Fame of Composition. 
However, then the Second World War appeared on the horizon, and as a Jewish citizen, Gearing had to flee the Nazi regime in 1939, eventually bringing her to New York City, where she lived until she died in 1970. In London, one of the stations on her refugee journey from Austria to the USA, the musician she met predicted a great career as a composer in the States for Gearing, if she made the right connection on the new continent. Gearing was ready and determined to continue her success in the US. She brought glowing recommendations with her that she collected during her time in London. For instance, the first solo cellist of the Vienna Philharmonics and State Opera, Professor Friedrich Buchsbaum, wrote in 1939 that this hardworking woman will surely have every opportunity available in every country and institution that cares for good music and progress. The city that she will choose will gain a valuable person. Composer Julius Isselis, who immigrated from Russia to the UK after the Anschluss in 1938, wrote that Elsie Geiring's compositions are original in harmony and structure and proof of her great gifts and mastery. Gearing herself, a player of wind instruments, was also praised for her sonata for oboe by the first oboist of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, Alexander Wunderer. He wrote that her work exploits um, exploits to the full the possibilities of the wind instruments. He counts her oboe piece as a valuable contribution to the otherwise inadequate literature for the oboe. Furthermore, Wunderer describes her compositional style as original and modern, not atonal. Indeed, Gearing developed her own style. Gearing's compositions, the compositional style is neither a pale imitation of Schoenberg's atonal style nor his 12-tone technique. It is the development of the thematic material, the shape of the melodies, the relationship of the harmonic sounds, and the ways all these elements grow into a convincing unity. This all in a late romantic fashion. At times, her music is reminiscent of Schoenberg's late romantic pieces, at times of Strauss, yet completely offering her its own style. Her music is not following the strict organization of serialism, it is not controlled and rooted in logic and rules. Put differently, Gearing did not follow rules and even told Schoenbeck, her teacher, that his textbook theory of harmony was not useful to her, since for her, the harmonies of her compositions are already part of the melodies. She saw the legitimization of her harmonies through compositional rules a waste of time. Tonight, we will hear two of Gearing's works performed by Dr. Galit Kaunitz oboe and Dr. Michael Bunchman piano. The first one was originally composed for orchestra. It is the Adagio on Rondo from the Concerto for Oboe and String Orchestra. The composition is undated, but most likely either had been composed in 1939 when Gearing came to the States or after 1950. When looking through the list of Gearing's composition, it becomes apparent that she was not afraid to compose for large ensembles. Yet, as performances of her works by symphony orchestras did not manifest, Gearing herself transcri transcribed some of her larger works for the piano. This is one of them. Another sign that she wanted her pieces to be accessible for performance. A wish we grant her tonight. Let's welcome Dr. Galit Kaunitz, oboe, and Dr. Michael Bunchman at the piano.
Gearing came to the United States in 1939 and was set to become a recognized composer. Despite her refugee journey to the US, her being confronted with a new country in a foreign language, her precarious financial situation at the beginning, her poor health her entire life, and a full-time job at a publishing house as a music editor, she still managed to have a prolific compositional output. Unfortunately, her letters tell us that her works did not receive the recognition she had hoped for. Some of her pieces were published in print and others in manuscript editions with the American Composers Alliance. Again, others still are awaiting publication. After regular performances of her works in Europe, it must have been a shock for Gearing to find her compositions to be performed infrequently in the US. Concerts at universities in New York and California and at the WNYC American Music Festivals were successes. However, she also had to digest rather negative reviews in newspapers. For instance, the New York Times wrote about a woodwind work performed at the C Carnegie Recital Hall that a movement of a wind quintet by Elizabeth Gearing had a sort of wrong note classicism that might have made greater impression if it had not been handicapped by a rather heavy rhythmic texture. Her lack of recognition put Gearing to the test. In 1949, she wrote in a letter about feeling ashamed that her works were not performed regularly. She also wrote about her need to compose. When she was happy, she started to compose. And when she was in a bad mood, she composed to unleash her anger. 
What might have been the reasons for Gearing's difficulty to gain a foothold in the American composition scene after a, a success in Europe? Her second husband, Otto Geiringer, saw her emigration status as the reason for her lack of securing performances. He wrote to a friend in 1947, Else has tried in vain to be recognized musically in the US. Thus far, it did not bear any fruits. She has composed numerous, and from what I hear, good pieces, but it is almost impossible to achieve something for a non-American born. She is not discouraged. She diligently keeps up her work." Unquote. Whether she could not gain a foothold in the New York scene due to her status as an immigrant, because she was Jewish, or because she was a woman cannot be answered. During an apparent grave stay at the hospital in 1966, four years before her death, Gearing wrote a letter to the American Composers Alliance with the request to save her compositions after her de death. In this letter, she also questions the reasons for her mega success. Maybe I'm not entirely to blame for not having gained prominence. Maybe it was lack of talent, but again, maybe it was lack of opportunity and of connections. However, in a list of her works she sent to a publishing house, she suggested her compositions be published using initials only, since there are enough prejudices against unknown composers anyway, one should not stir up the additional ones against women composers. Elizabeth Gearing passed away in 1970 after having fought for recognition for years. During one of her numerous hospitalizations, she ensured that all of her compositions would be taken care of. Her will, which she wrote in 1949, shows her humor. She wrote, as to my funeral, if it's not too expensive, I would like to be cremated. I always like to smoke. <laughs> but the will primarily dealt with what should happen to her compositions after her death, two thirds of her will, as we can see on the slide. She wanted them to be accessible at university libraries and through the American Composers Alliance. This is also the aim of today's recital, making Elizabeth Gearing's work heard and accessible to the public. Let's listen to the second piece of the evening. It is the Suite for Oboe and Piano, composed in 1942 in New York City. It has three movements, Andante, Andantino Cantabile, Theme and Variation, and a third movement titled Concert Piece, Allegro. Let's welcome back to the stage Dr. Kaunitz and Dr. Bunchman. Thank you. 